Hey, glad that you are here today. If you have a Bible, open them to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. We'll get there in a few, few moments. Now, it's kind of crazy when I was growing up a little bit. Um, I'm kind of a child of the 70s and the 80s, more or less. And uh, back in the day, we didn't have this over-concern with security. We didn't. I, 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 my, the house I grew up in, the different homes we had growing up, we didn't have a burglar alarm. Almost every house today or apartment has a, has a burglar alarm, a house alarm. We didn't have that. We didn't have car alarms. It was so easy to take that coat hanger and just open up any car in the world for granted. I didn't do that, but, you know, almost any car today, you know, no matter what you're driving, a Prius or a Porsche, eek, 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 eek. We have car alarms, don't we? We have people usually uh, in your apartment or sometimes in your home, a guard gate, and sometimes a guard is there. Uh, even our, our, our cell phones, right? Our, our cell phones have locks on them, so you have to, you know, do that or, you know, look at it with your beautiful, you know, photo, and it opens it, Right? What's up with that? Why why do we do that? Why why do we have this over-concern, or maybe it's not an over-concern, it's just a concern for security and safety. It's really simple. We want to protect things that are valuable to us. We want to protect, protect our home, our family, our kids, our stuff that we feel are valuable, our information, in our computer or our laptop or our cell phone, we want to protect things that are valuable to us. So most of us here are diligent, aren't we? Diligent about the alarms and systems we have in our life to protect what's valuable. Now, the sad thing is, in our protection-obsessed, alarm-obsessed, security-obsessed society. The tragedy is this, is that many times we do not protect or we fail to protect the most valuable thing in your life and in my life. And worry slips in. And fear slips in. And resentment begins to grow. What happens? What do we fail to protect? Well, an iconic verse from Proverbs puts it this way. It says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. We protect our homes. We protect our cars. We protect our precious cell phones. But so many times we fail to protect our hearts and our souls. So how do we do that? How do we protect and guard our hearts, and why is that so important? That's what we're going to look at today. Now, perhaps you're wondering, or maybe you're not wondering, why am I wearing this flowery summer Aloha-like shirt? Well, I'll tell you, some of you know because you've been to the parties in your class. Today is what we call Splash Sunday. I like that. Splash Sunday. So we are promoting people. So if you're in the first grade last year, you're in the second grade class, you're officially in second grade. Third graders, officially in fourth grade. This is a big Sunday. Also, for us adults in the room or young people, if you're not plugged into or involved in one of our adult Bible study classes, which is really a community group. It's a place where you can meet people. It's a place where you can understand how to serve other people and how to develop a sense of community. We're starting brand new ones Sunday and next Sunday. So dive in, okay? Dive in. It's Splash Sunday, and we would love to have you. It'll make a tremendous difference in your life. All right. Speaking of differences in your life, okay. I I like... I like comfort food. I do. I like comfort food. I like meatloaf and gravy. I like biscuits. I like cornbread. I like pork chops. 
back in the day, every week, I ate fried chicken. Many times Kentucky fried chicken after church. That was just the norm. You get a big old bucket, mashed potatoes and gravy. I love that. Breakfast, pancakes, syrup, waffles. Are you hungry yet? So I, I like comfort food. I, I really do. I, I, I love it. But what I've discovered in life, as most of us have, you can't eat comfort food all the time. You can't. You gotta have your veggies, you gotta have your protein if you're gonna grow stronger. So I thought about that as we're looking at today's passage and next week's passage in 1 Corinthians chapter number six, is that it's not comfort food. And and some churches um, around our country, all they, all they do is talk about comfort food verses. And, and there are many verses and passages and sections in the Bible that are comforting. And we need to be comforted and we need to be encouraged. But I don't know about you. I also need to be convicted. I need to be corrected. I need to be coached. So if we're going to be faithful to teaching and trying to apply God's word, we've got to listen not only to the comfort food, the biscuits and gravy, we also need to listen to the broccoli and the spinach, okay? we got to have a balanced diet. We've got to be willing to receive comfort from God and his word, but also conviction and correction. So let's see what trouble our good friends in Corinth have gotten into this week, right? Check it out. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verses 7 following. And in that, embedded in these passages, we're going to see the importance of our heart and how to guard our heart. Verse 7, he says, The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not, why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourself cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. So, there's a whole verse, uh, verses before this where Paul is talking about all these Christians in this particular church are suing one another, going to a secular court, having a judge decide what they're going to do. Paul's saying, you can't do that. That's, that's, that's a black eye on our church community. That's a black eye on Christianity. Don't do it. And then he goes into another list. He goes into what, what people call a vice list. And he has a vice list here in, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I think he has another vice list in Galatians 5 and, and another one maybe in Corinthians. So, I mean, excuse me, in Colossians. Here's what he goes. He says, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse 11. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, this vice list that Paul just laid out for us was indicative but not comprehensive of what's going on there in Corinth. Now, next week, I know some of these verses dealt with some sexually charged issues. We'll get to that next week. But for now, we've got to go back and realize what was going on in Corinth. The the primary thing that was going on in Corinth was this, is that this church was allowing the culture, not Christ, to set the temperature for their community. You know, if you're married here or whatever, you know, you you have a thermostat war, you know, you're hotter, colder, hotter, colder, right? Right. They were having, there was no thermostat war here in Corinth. The culture was setting the temperature. The culture was calling the shots. It infiltrated the church, and they were involved in all type of immorality and chicanery, if you would. And so Paul is, 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 talking to them, as we've seen the past few Sundays, he was was talking to them as a father. He was talking to them as a coach, trying to help them understand that what they were doing, 
the lifestyle they were living, the pride that they had the, the, in the way that they were sinning was simply destructive to their lives, destructive to the lives of others. It was damaging to their heart. They were not guarding their heart. Think about this question for a second. And maybe you're still involved in school. Think about who was the most influential teacher you ever had. And I know it's hard to rank number one. So it's like, what's your favorite song? What's your favorite movie? Don't, don't ask me that. I don't have a favorite. So maybe think of two or three of your favorite teachers that you had. Just kind of have that person in your mind, the man or that woman. Okay? So I'm thankful for teachers, by the way. I really am. They've been some of the most influential people in my life. Yes, absolutely. I'm also a teacher, too, so that was kind of self-promoting. But anyway, so, but I am thankful for teachers. That's why I'm a teacher. So um, my favorite th- teacher, maybe of all time, he may be number one, he's close, was a journalism professor I had in college by the name of Dr. Loyal Gould. Dr. Loyal Gould. He was quite a character. This guy, in his lifetime and his career, he worked for the Associated Press. He was the only American journalist to cover the Nuremberg trials. Uh, he interviewed Martin Luther King Jr. He interviewed Richard Nixon. He interviewed John F. Kennedy. Um, he was a card-carrying Democrat, but he hated Ted Kennedy. That's a whole other sermon. He had so many stories. And so this guy was quite the character. He always lectured without notes, right? And so he had this gruff voice. You know, and he would start off every class, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. And then he would just go off into some crazy story, you know. And uh, I'll I'll never forget, this is a sidebar, but it's worth it. I'll never forget, the, the only test question I think I ever remember in my entire life was one of his test questions. It was this. He said, what U.S. president shared a lover with Chicago mob syndicate Momo Jingakana? A, Jimmy Carter, B, Ronald Reagan, C, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, or D, John F. Kennedy. So I'll never forget that, a real test question in college. But Dr. Gould was quite the professor. He was quite the lecturer. And he would say a, a lot of things over and over again. And again, this was the 80s. You know, they still had music and video on MTV. This is the 80s. And, 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 and Dr. Gould would say this. Television is a vast wasteland of garbage. We probably only had four stations back then. You know, cable was just getting on. I mean, television is a vast wasteland of garbage. He would say that over and over again. And then he would say this one line. Hammered it into our little pliable college brains. He said, what you don't know will kill you. Now, of course, he would open and openly smoke camels right after the lecture. But anyway, what you don't know will kill you. And he would go in to proceed uh, to tell you about some international event or somebody he interviewed that was famous or some politician or powerful person and how, you know, that knowledge, pre- you know, prevented them uh, from dying. And so, anyway, I'll never forget that line. What you don't know will kill you. And I don't think he means that literally, though it could be taken literally. I think he also means that spiritually and metaphorically. So Paul in this passage here is saying that. He's saying, folks, friends, Romans, countrymen, listen, you're living in a way that's destructive. And he, and he asked basically several questions. He says, don't you know don't you know that this is not the way to live? Don't you know the, that this lifestyle you're living, the sexual morality you're engaging in, the lying, the greediness, the swindling, the taking your own friends to court to sue them, this is simply not the way to live? God did not design the world this way. God did not design you this way. Don't you see this is not the way to live? There's going to be a payday someday for the way you're living. There are going to be consequences that are going to kick into your life. 
And by the way, these consequences are going to kick in whether you believe in God or whether you don't believe in God. The consequences will kick in. It's like this guy I read about um, years ago. Um, his name was Gary Tyndall, and he was caught, I think, robbing a bank. So we went before the judge, Judge Rodriguez, and he was there during the trial situation. And, and standing in front of the judge, Gary asked, may I have permission to go to the bathroom? And the judge said yes. So they took him, guard took him, policeman took him out of the courtroom, went up to the second floor. Uh, you know, guard was there, stood outside of the bathroom. Gary's in the bathroom. And he has a grand idea. I'm going to escape. So he climbs up, you know, the plumbing, gets up the wall, and there's a panel. He pushes the panel, okay? And he gets into the crawl space. And he crawls about 30 feet up into the ceiling, going south, trying to find his way to freedom. And to all of a sudden, boom, a panel gives way. And you, you guess it, boom, he plops and crashes right down in the middle of Judge Rodriguez's court, okay? <laughs> True story. So many times we think we're just going to kind of crawl away and get away with what we're doing and the lifestyle that we're leading. But there's going to come a point in time in your life where the panel is going to give way and you're going to crash to the ground. He's urging us today. Wake up. Don't, don't you realize the consequences of engaging in this kind of lifestyle? It's beneath you. It's degrading to you. And you will crash. What else does he ask here? He says, don't, don't you know that this way you're living, that this harms others around you? It, it, it's, it's, listen, sin is not a solo sport. I can just engage in, in this behavior. I can just do this. This is simply for me and for my pleasure. It's not going to affect anyone else. That's a lie. That's not true. Your rebellion, your lifestyle, what you're doing when you're rebelling against God's ways, not only affects you and your heart and your soul, it affects so many people around you. I think about the story in the Bible of old King David. I mean, do you think about David? It, you know, the verse starts off, when most kings are out to war, David stayed back in the palace. And he gets onto his computer and goes to Bathsheba.com, Right? He enters into an affair, an adulterous relationship with her. He has her to cover up the affair. He has her husband sent to the front lines and murdered. Then he's lying to her, lying to the people. He's lying to Nathan the prophet. And then once his sin falls out, once he crashes to the ground, the thousands and thousands of people that he affected in his kingdom, in his leadership, in his business, if you would, how that affected his family and his kids that would come after him. The consequences. It didn't just affect him, it affected everyone around him. When you look at this vice list, think about the people who were affected by the immorality. The other people who were affected when you steal. The family bonds that are broken. The trust that's broken. The money that's lost. It's devastating. So he's saying, don't you know? <laughs> what you don't know will kill you. These things, these, these habits, these patterns that you're engaging in, Corinthians, Houstonians, are absolutely destructive to your own heart and to the hearts of others around you. And another question he asks is this. This is kind of the positive question in verse 11. He says, don't you know this is not who you are? Don't you know, this is not who you are. He says, you, such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. So what does that mean? I like to use the analogy of a river. So when you think about 
entering into a relationship with God or asking Jesus into your heart or whatever terminology you want to use, when you think about having a born-again experience, what does that look like? Because some people, no matter if you were raised in a Baptist church or a Catholic church or somewhere in between, think of it almost as a one-off experience. Well, I did this, I was confirmed, therefore I'm in. Hail Mary, full of grace. Or I was at the camp and I asked Jesus into my heart and I was done. You know, hallelujah, you know, Baptist, whatever. Right, it's kind of a one-off deal, I'm in, don't have to worry about it again. It doesn't work that way. That's not, that's not God's design for, for your life and for my life and for salvation. So salvation, if you would, is like a river, okay? You get into the river and you are baptized. You are washed. You say, God, I, I need you. God, I confess that I've done a lot of horrible, horrific things. I've broken your laws. I'm sinful. God, I want to turn from this lifestyle, and I want to follow you. And by God's incredible grace, God forgives you. He cleanses you. He washes you. You're justified, which means you're declared acceptable in God's sight because of what Christ has done for you. And you're in. Man, you're in. You're baptized. You're washed. And we're going to we're going to have a baptismal experience in about two or three weeks from now. So just hold on to that. So you start off here in the river. You're baptized. This is where you start. But if you've been in any river, any river whatsoever, a river has what in it? A current. And that current is going to take you somewhere. So I've received Christ into my heart and my life. I've trusted him. I've been baptized. And the current is that sanctification where God's spirit comes to live inside of your heart and my life, and then we start living in a different way. And that sanctification is going to take us all the way down the river until we enter into the ocean, if you would, that is the kingdom of God or heaven. But if you were justified, born again, declared righteous, baptized, if you would, you will be sanctified. There will be a desire in your heart and your mind to follow strong after God. And when we hear his word, to be convicted of these sins and other sins so that we can turn away from them. And then eventually we'll be welcomed into heaven. Again, our acceptance before God, our acceptance into heaven is always based upon what Christ has done for us. It is not works at the same time, we will produce fruit. We will show life and evidence that we have been baptized and washed. Okay? So that's, that's the river, if you would, of the salvation experience, or if you would, of the Christian journey. Does that, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So um, it's so critical that as we read these passages, we, we realize that. And that we're, we're aware that we're always a work in progress. Okay? And so, you know, when you read this passage and you read this vice list, and it says, he says again, do you not know that none of these people will inherit the kingdom of God? None of these people will make it to heaven? I have to ask the question, will I make it? Will I make it? Will I make it into heaven? Well, I inherit the kingdom of God. Because I could read another vice list, another sin list, and everybody's going to, wow, that's me. So, so the difference is this. The difference is, you know, not, you know, once you're born again, once you're justified right here, not that you live this perfect life. No one's done that. No one's living the perfect life. You know, Paul lays it out in Romans 7, doesn't he? The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing. That struggle that we all deal with. But that's the key. Are we struggling? Are, are, we, are we battling? Are we looking at our life? Are we saying, God, convict me. God, help me to be aware of the areas of sin in my life as I look at this list or others. God, show me where I am missing it. And I want to be back in this river of life. I want to guard my heart because I know that the springs of life come out of my heart. So the question is, are we, are we fighting 
are we actively fighting this anti-God energy called sin in our life? Are we fighting it? Are we turning from it? Are we saying, God, forgive me and cleanse me? Holy Spirit, help me. Help me on this path to follow you. Again, you may be struggling right now, but listen, it, it may be your struggle, but this is not your identity. It's not your identity. It's not your identity. I am who God says I am. You are who God says you are. As we were singing earlier today, God says that you are a child of God. God says that you are an ambassador. God said that you're accepted. God says that you're chosen. God says that you are his son, you are his daughter, and you can cry out, Abba, Father. That is our identity. As we go through this journey of life, as we continue to get into the flow of this river of the life that God has for us. Basically, he's saying to us today, you need to live up to who you already are. You need to live up to who you already are. You're a child of the king. You're God's child. You are beloved by God. And as God, your father, he has your best interests in mind. And we have to follow that. Ray Stedman uh, was a godly, godly pastor for many, many years, mentored thousands of people. And many years ago, he was reading this passage. He was teaching from 1 Corinthians 6, verses 7 and following. And he started reading, you know, do you cheat those? Do you do those? Uh, don't you know that wrongdoers want and care the kingdom of heaven? Don't be deceived. Idolaters, sexually immoral, adulterers. And he started reading off this list. And he just stopped after it. He stopped reading it in front of his congregation. And uh, he said, you know, how many of you have, have, have committed any of these sins on this vice list? How many of you have committed that? And he said, I, I want you to show me by standing up. And so he just kind of waited and waited. And he said to himself at that time, this probably wasn't a good idea. And finally, an elderly lady stood up. And then another guy stood up, and another person stood up. And after a while, almost everyone in the congregation was standing and said, I'm a part of this list. <laughs> and he said, don't you see? We're dealing with the same stuff that they dealt with. We're trying to fight against the same things they fought against here today, thousands of years later. And then after the service, a young guy came up to Dr. Stedman and said, Dr. Stedman, I've got to tell you this. I, you know, I just received Christ just a few days ago. And, and, and I knew I, I had to come to church, um, but I, I was afraid that, that I wasn't going to fit in. And, and when you ask people to stand you know, from this list, I didn't want to stand to be the only one here. That, what you said kind of freaked me out. But then once I saw everyone else standing, everyone else owning their stuff, I realized these are my kind of people. <laughs> the church is not a country club for saints, but a hospital for sinners. And God wants us, as people who are seeking healing, to guard, to guard our hearts. Let's pray together. God, we need you. We need you every single moment of every single day. We need you on Monday as much as we need you on Sunday. God, um, I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for our willingness, God, to listen to you speak to us through your word. And God, I, I, I know that there are probably some people here today that have never walked down these aisles and said yes to you. They've never really 
uh, jumped into the river. Maybe they kind of uh, stuck their toes in it or maybe their hands to feel the current, but they've never really jumped in with you and said, yes, God, I need you, and God, I want to follow you. So, Father, I pray for those here today who that's, that's where they are. God, made, I just ask you to give them the courage to stand and to walk down front today and to experience everything that you have for them. Lord, other people are thinking about how do I come back to God, and that's where they are today, and they're finding their way back to you, back to that river of life. God, may they stand and come down front. Lord, others here, they know you, they're following you, and uh, they're simply looking to a place to connect. They're simply looking to a place to belong. They're looking for a church, a place where they can call home. A church that's willing to deal with the tough passages in your word. The church is willing to deal with the messy process of growing with you. So God, I pray for Christians here, for students, for singles, for families and couples. You need to stand and walk down front and say, hey, I want to join or we want to join second today. This is our desire. Father, I ask you to give them that push to stand and to come down front today. God, we give you this time of invitation. This is our prayer in Jesus' name.